I'm going to want to provide a brief overview of this week's module. So to see how I came into it, you could start off with our main syllabus page. And then from here, each week there's a module. Uh, I have my list of items to do over here. It's going to be different years, but your to-do list also kind of shows you what you need to do and what's due each week. But I'm going to start off with modules because I have it organized week by week in the modules. So I'm going to scroll down to week three. We're in week three right now. And I'm going to hit the overview. And that will get me started in the week three overview. And this week we're going to really, we're going to focus in on chapter 19, making smart, healthy choices. Note, it was becoming a healthy, uh, responsible health consumer in your older edition. And the learning outcomes are for this week are to really know why it's important to be a responsible healthcare consumer and what, what traits you need to have. And one of those is being very health literate. So really understanding some very key health literacy terms and there are different levels of health literacy out there. So embedded in there, I put a tool on all the ways you can measure someone's health literacy. Uh, discuss uh, conventional healthcare. So what's typical healthcare, the typical healthcare providers out there from doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners to physician's assistants. What, what level of training do they need and what are their responsibilities? We're going to talk about complementary and integrative healthcare. So we're going to talk about how the healthcare system works together to make referrals um, and the different types of health insurance that are out there from your HMOs to your PPOs to the different levels of how health insurance works. We're going to talk about the healthcare system and, and we're going to hit on some of the health challenges. So I'm going to click you through this module. Now, now very important, um, if you're listening to this, which is really good, um, the big thing that you need to take out of this is that you need to do both chapter one and then practice chapter eight, uh, uh, the um, homework for this module, which is chapter 19, and if you're in the old book, chapter 18. But it's on the healthcare literacy on healthcare consumers, and it's making healthy choices. So you need to do the homework that's in week one and embedded in here in week three prior to taking your quiz. Practice that many, many times. I also put a Jeopardy game in there that you can attempt for um, this, this week and see if you can get all the questions right. Do that prior to taking your quiz. Once you take your quiz, it's gonna be opened, it's gonna be timed, you could take it two times. So go through this entire module and listen to this whole entire um, overview here to make sure that you've got everything all in order. So I'm gonna click next. And, um, and this is the PowerPoint for this week. Um, and so I'm gonna download this PowerPoint here. I'm downloading it. And I noticed if you go too fast, it, it doesn't open up. And so I'm enabling it right now. And I'm gonna start with the slideshow. Now you could print out this PowerPoint, have it in front of you. And, um, and right there you could see um, that we are gonna be focusing in, and let me see if I can bring this over to here, um, to the different slides. So um, basically I want you to know the difference between when you should go to a doctor and when you should not go to the doctor, um, urgent care specifically. Um, and go to a doctor when you have a fever that can't go away, when there's been a head injury. Um, so sudden fever uh, for children over 102, for adults 103. Tingling sensation in the arm accompanied by slurred speech, obviously immediately get into urgent care when you have adverse reactions to a drug or an insect bite. And then for going to the doctor, these are all urgent care. For going to the doctor, unexplained weight loss, persistent recurring diarrhea. Um, if you have blue colored lips, eyelids or nail beds, that's going to urgent care. Um, blood in the stool or urine um, would definitely mean going to the doctor. So really paying attention to some of these things like yelling at the skins or the white of the eyes. All these are really big symptoms in, in pregnancy, too. Those um, mean going to the doctor. Um, did you know that um, one of the big things that comes into healthcare is, 
is that um, is malpractice insurance. And a minimum of 210,000 Americans are estimated to die each year because of preventable errors in hospitals. Your doctors are human. Um, nurses are human. We're all human. And I think one of the big things is making sure you have a good conversation with your doctor and you understand the risk. So one of the things that I put on um, the module is um, a very short, um, and I'm going to embed this, a very short malpractice information and some of the things that happen out there. So you need to know that you need to assess your health professional. So I have to tell you, I interview my doctors, and if you have if you're able to, to choose your doctor and really work and find a primary care doctor, that is the ideal. Everyone needs to have one doctor that really knows their history. But you need to know your rights as a patient. You have a right to informed consent. So it's never, oh, we're gonna start doing this procedure and we're just gonna start doing this. You need to know what all the details of the procedure, what they're gonna to do to you, what the risks are, um, what are some of the things that you need to know about prior? You need to know everything, both the positive and the negative. You have the right to know if the treatment is standard. Is this typical? Or is this a new experimental treatment that hasn't been done that often? I can tell you that doctors, um, the more they practice something, the better they are, just like everybody. So experimental has newness in it. And just like everything, there's a learning curve that goes with anything that's experimental. You have the right to privacy, and this is a big one. Your privacy is big, and it's called HIPAA compliance, following the rules that your information does not, is not shared unless you give permission for that doctor or nurse to share it. And you have the right to receive care, and no one should be denied care based on religion, ethnicity, um, their um, level of um, finances, that there's something called indigenous care where a hospital will always give care to someone um, whether they have funds or not. And then here's one that's very important. You have a right to all your medical records. Do you have copies of your medical records? You have the right to get copies of those medical records. Sometimes they'll charge you for copying them, but know that it is your right to get access to these medical records. And then you're, this is a big one. You have a right to seek a second opinion. Whenever you're not comfortable with something, and, and a doctor might kind of look at you and go, why do you want that second opinion? Because I want a second opinion, just like in life, I want someone else to look at these records, um, my information, and, and give me one more opinion before we do something. I need that. And you can get a third opinion and a fourth opinion, but you have a right to a second opinion. Um, here are the questions that you need to ask a provider. Um, you need to, um, um, you should always ask the provider what their background is, what their history is um, in doing um, a procedure, where they received their education, um, what their philosophy is around healthcare, um, where they believe in preventative uh, and using holistic care. Um, and so that's something that's very important. And also, you're allowed to often ask and push back and say, I don't understand why I'm getting this treatment. Can you explain that to me more? Um, I need to slow down. Um, you mentioned this, please define that for me a little bit more. Every doctor or, and nurse should give you a health education and explain things all the way through. And sometimes there's mixed diagnosis. Um, sometimes that could be a problem. So. Um, one of the big things is that sometimes what people, doctors, it drives doctors nuts when people come in and they start looking up everything on the web. Um, and so they start getting diagnoses on the internet, which can drive your doctor crazy because they're like, eh, you need to, you need to get good, solid medical information. And what's on the internet is not always accurate, as we know. Um, social media has all kinds of crazy posts on them. Some of them are so fake that it's almost entertaining, but it's not because sometimes people actually think it's real. That's a problem. Um, you know, I think one of the things that medical professionals can do, think about it, how can medical professionals actually push information out to get the correct information out to people? And then um, you need to know that reliable health sites or anything that ends with EDU, 
um, GOV, um, and that have been vetted and peer reviewed. So, see module um, on the video uh, for the video on this misdiagnosis um, and how how prevalent it is. Conventional healthcare or allopathic health medicine is anything that um, results to getting sick. A pathogen is an illness and then preventing um, the disease and restoring you back to health using vaccines, drugs, surgery, or other treatments. So conventional healthcare is what we kind of call Western medicine. These are all the different types of conventional health practitioners. Do you know them? A primary care practitioner is an MD or a DO. Um, osteopaths work within um, skeleton and muscles and use naturopathic. Um, and then op op um, Op ophthalmologist is someone who's doing something around eye surgery. Um, optometrist, which is correcting vision. Dentist, uh, um, obviously is a dentist with dental care. A nurse, a nurse practitioner is under the care of a physician, but they can actually prescribe medicine. Um, and a physician assistant is similar to a nurse practitioner, albeit different. Physician assistants also under the care of a, a doctor. So they are working underneath a doctor, but they can prescribe and give information. Here are some of the conventional health products, antidepressants, hormones. Um, those things are prescribed and need, you need a, a prescription. And then you have over-the-counter drugs. Those are anything that you could purchase um, at a pharmacy. One of the big things is knowing what the active ingredients are and the purpose of the medication. Um, generics are the cheaper version of a prescription and they use the same ingredients, um, active ingredients, and they use the same approach, um, but they, are, they don't have the same packaging. Um, and sometimes they might have some products that are a little bit different, but they are generally the same um, active ingredients as the um, generic and the ones that you get with the, the you know, the, pharma uh, the pharmaceutical ones that have na brain names, names to them. Generics are always cheaper, by the way. So these are the 10 most common um, therapies among adults. Number one, a lot of people use natural products, but I think it's really important to know that natural products are not always, in general, are not controlled by the Food Drug Administration, so they're not, they're, they're not regulated as much as anything over the counter or any prescription drugs. Then it goes into deep breathing, meditation, chiropractics are very important, uh, I mean, are very popular, massage, yoga, and then you can see it going all the way down to homeopathic, which is taking a small substance and then adding, um, adding more other ingredients to it. And there hasn't been a lot of research around a homeopathic that shows that it's that's evidence-based. So realize that each one of these um, are, um, are some that have evidence behind them and some that do not. So these are all alternative treatments. And um, another alternative medical system is traditional Chinese medicine um, and um, Asian medicines and homeopathy, naturopathy, um, you might have heard of acupuncture and acupressure. Um, Native American um, cultures also have alternative systems. And then so manipulative and body-based. So these are actually manipulating the body to change. Um, there's something called energy medicine that's using um, the chi um, to um, reduce or alleviate symptoms. And I can tell you that there is research out there for acupuncture and acupressure, uh, Reiki, Qigong, all of these, um, especially acupressure and acupuncture, um, they're very good at reducing pain. Um, not, I don't know so much about the research around reducing uh, and curing, but they have had research proving that it does reduce pain. Um, and so they come in and they hit on these key points and think about your nervous system and how it works um, and how sometimes you get tingling sensations. This is putting pressure on key points to alleviate and put pressure to stop the pain. 
And so there is something that says that acupuncture is, is it, it does put um, pressure on some of the key, key areas and stops a loop mechanism for nerves being fired. And there is, um, it is very good for pain reduction, for treating migraine headaches, and things like that. So that's very good for, for people to, to maybe sometimes research that if they're trying to reduce pain. The other thing is um, out there that's alternative medicine is um, herbal remedies. And herbal remedies um, are not controlled by the Food Drug Administration. And so sometimes these can actually interfere with prescription drugs. So it's very important to tell a medical professional if, if someone is taking a lot of herbal supplements. There's something that also is very important to know that the U.S. Um, pharma, um, pharmacopoeia has a verified mark, USP. Um, that's something to look for on vitamins, and that actually shows that this is that they have the level of vitamins or whatever supplement that you're taking has been verified. And when I talk to nutritionists, they always tell me that to look for the USP mark when getting um, vitamins. So where do we spend our healthcare dollars? 31% goes into healthcare, hospital care, 27% to professional services, 17% into administrative, and then 13% into long-term and home care, and then 12% into drugs, um, which is interesting. You could see a lot, of, a lot of money going into hospital care. We spent 3.1 trillion on healthcare. And I can tell you that, um, we spend the most in the United States on healthcare than anyone in the world. And we do have health disparities. Not everyone has hack access to healthcare. So this is interesting with health insurance. Um, right now we still have a lot of people that are uninsured and the Affordable uh, Care Act did reduce the um, number of people um, that were um, that are now uh, that did not have health insurance. So we've increased our access to health care, um, but we still have a lot of problems in the United States. Um, you know that um, you probably have heard of this, the Affordable Health Care Act. This was put in in 2010, and it made it illegal now to have something called where you can um, have um, denied treatment to someone who is um, has a pre-existing condition that now is against the law. So if someone has cancer or some condition or diabetes, they cannot be denied health insurance by, um, uh, by a health care provider, I mean by a health insurance provider. They cannot be denied now, so that's against the law. Access um, is really determined by the, the provider. So there's something called PPOs, HMOs, so preferred provider organization. You need to read up on that in your book. Um, and that is um, where you, get, you have to stay within a network. And then um, HMOs, health maintenance organizations, where you're staying something like a Kaiser Permanente, where you're staying within the network. Um, again, we spend more on health care than any other nation, but we do not have universal health care. So when I mentioned the HMOs, the PPOs, um, people have to be signed up for those with the, under private insurers. But if you're not under HMO, or a PPO like Kaiser or Blue Cross Anthem. Then there's a, a, a Medicare and Medi-Cal, which will do some coverage. Let's say you don't qualify for any of those. You don't have private insurance. You don't, have, you can't, you don't qualify for Medi-Cal Medi or Medicare. Then one thing that, we're really, that the United States is hoping to go for is universal health care. And that's the idea that everyone should be on some health insurance plan. So if you do not have a health insurance plan, you need to know that you could, that enrollment for health insurance is really short now than it's ever been. It ends in December. And you could go to Covered California to check out your health care insurance plans. So let's see if you know these different types. So I mentioned them in the, the PowerPoint slides before, but do you know the difference between a PPO Preferred provider organization. So this is a list of medical providers that is within a network. And then you cannot go out of that. If you go out of that, then you get charged more. 
An HMO is a health maintenance organization, and you cannot go outside of this organization. It's like a Kaiser Permanente. You have to go in to a Kaiser Permanente doctor. You cannot go out of network ever. And then a point of service is a, is a combination of a PPO and an HMO. Um, and that's uh, basically the same concept, but you're going on a, a, fee, a sliding fee scale for service. And then do you know the difference between Medicaid and, Med and Medicare? So this next slide is Medicaid. Um, Medicaid is an assistance program. So it's, it's targeting low-income people of every age. And it's the idea that if you, meet, you have a certain income, then you can qualify for Medicaid. And it's important to know that, um, that children um, that fall into this bracket with Medicaid have access to vaccines and, and wellness exams. And so there's no reason why a child cannot be vaccinated or receive health care um, if they meet an income level, low income, because they can get it through Medicaid. Um, and that goes for adults too, um, less so, but adults can be covered under Medicaid if they meet the income requirement. Um, then after, um, then we fast forward to Medicare and Medicare is paid for those who are over 65. And what you know is that um, Medicare can kick in and people over 65 can act, have access to both Medicare and to Medicaid. So Medicare is for those over 65 and Medicaid is for an income practice. And I put the website on here so that you can look this up and you can research it more. Okay, and so last but not least, my last slide is the Jeopardy Challenge, which is on the module and it's for the health insurance. And so I challenge you to open up that PowerPoint, put it into slide mode and take the Jeopardy Challenge and see if you can answer every single question in that challenge, okay? Great. If you have any questions, make sure to post them. And again, please do all the homework before you start quiz one. Super, super important. This week, there are no discussion items or anything like that. Your role this week is to do the homework and to take quiz one. That's it. All right. Have a great week. Bye.